Unlike the Vietnamese, where you had like a first wave of more, well, you're in a, you know, privileged Vietnamese who got in. The vast majority of them, or not vast majority, 55% of them were placed in some of the poorest inner city neighborhoods in the country, just off the bat, right? So the federal government says, okay, you're going here. But then those who were settled to more rural or suburban areas eventually made it to these poor areas by way of what we call secondary migration because they found it they were just too isolated in the places that they were resettled. So I would say, although there are no official numbers, more, more, it's more like 75% were placed in these hyper-ghetto areas. Now, in the Bronx in particular, you had up to 10,000 Cambodians who resettled to the area throughout the 90s. But by the mid-1990s, um, excuse me, throughout the 80s, but by the mid-1990s, the population levels off at about 4,000, and that's simply because most of them found the conditions just intolerable, untenable, especially around housing, which I'll talk about. And so by the two, 2000, when we look at the 2000 census, this is what we're looking at in terms of Cambodian numbers. About 43% living in poverty, 24% unemployment, 62% without a high school education, and 80% welfare participation. Um, these are the highest such numbers of any race, race or ethnic group in the U.S. per capita, save for Native American uh, tribes. Okay. Um, so how do, how do we understand this? And, and here I'd agree with anthropologist Iwa Ong, who in Buddha is hiding, um, argues that the model minority thesis is irrelevant. We look at these numbers and it's pretty clear. Uh, by the early 90s, journalists and policymakers begin removing Cambodians and Laotians, who also demonstrate similar numbers, from the model minority category, separating them from, quote, ethnic Chinese immigrants from Hong Kong, Taiwan, and China, along with Vietnamese immigrants, end quote. But having been cast out of the model minority, the question becomes, how are these Southeast Asian refugees now going to be figured by hegemonic racism? That is, what is their new racial location? In Ong's, in Ong's assessment, Cambodians and Laotians were racialized as a new underclass. Specifically, she claims that they were subjected to a, quote, ideological blackening in contrast to the whitening experienced by Vietnamese and Chinese immigrants, end quote. However, the terms of this blackening are unclear in Ong's rendering. On the one hand, she appears to equate blackening with a range of low-wage laborers mired in working poverty because they have few skills to match the primary labor market. Among these are, quote, Ethiopians, Afghans, and other Central Americans, and even other Central Americans, end quote. But on the other hand, she uses blackening to refer to the way in which Cambodians and Laotians are associated along with poor African Americans with high unemployment, welfare dependency, teenage pregnancy rates, quote, because of their location and isolation in inner city neighborhoods, end quote. So in making this case for the blackening of the refugee, Ang conflates two very distinct racial formations. But notwithstanding these conceptual dilemmas, Ang's analysis leads me to question how a blackening of this sort, if we were to follow that logic, um, the making of a new underclass out of refugees was possible under the terms of liberal warfare in the hyper ghetto. In other, in other words, how was it possible for refugees to suddenly become the enemies of liberalism? Were they now being targeted for dispersal, divestment, planned shrinkage, and other war tactics? Allow me to return to Mimi Wynn's definition of liberal warfare as violence that claims to be, quote, incidental to it, its exercise of power to free others from a named enemy who is in their midst, end quote. I argue that in the Northwest Bronx and other hyper-ghettos of the 1980s, black and to varying, to varying degrees Latino tenants were targeted as the primary enemies of liberalism to be dispersed by planned shrinkage, shrinkage or punished for staying behind in hollowed out ghettos after the insurrections of 67 and 68. Southeast Asians, by contrast, were inserted into these sites of liberal warfare as those who should be rescued from it, as those deserving of freedom. To grant liberal warfare's continuance, however, their rescue could never be realized. Instead, the refugees were continuously positioned as collateral damage, those incidentally injured in the war to rescue them. Specifically, they were held in derelict housing conditions so that they could be targeted for a rescue that could never actually take place, a fictive rescue that justified liberal warfare. These and other forms of ongoing urban captivity rendered talk of a model minority irrelevant 
But this did not mean that Southeast Asian refugees were subjected to the same forms of vilif vilification and ridicule that were directed at the putative underclass. Instead, I argue that Cambodian refugees were subject to a set of alternative practices I term refugee exceptionalism. The ideo ideologies and discursive practices that figure refugees as necessarily in the hyper ghetto, but never of it. It is the process whereby refugees are resettled into and then recurrently saved from the hyper ghetto and its attendant modalities of captivity. Uninhabitable housing stock, permanent exclusion from the labor market, and punitive social policy. However, refugee exceptionalism never actually removes the refugee from hyper ghetto spaces and institutions, certainly not in any material sense. On the contrary, it requires that she be held in perpetual captivity so that she can be used over and again. The goals of refugee exceptionalism are twofold. First, to, make, to mask the systemic inequalities and violences of a re refugee resettlement program that, as an extension of the US colonial and the imperial project in Southeast Asia, proclaimed Cambodians and other Southeast Asian refugees to be the beneficiaries of American liberal freedoms that the U.S. cannot successfully deliver through its acts of warfare. And we lost the war. <laughs> <laughs> By casting refugees as subsisting in an unending state of arrival at liberalism, those whose struggles with poverty in the urban U.S. are deemed perpetually, perpetually temporary and adaptive, refugee exceptionalism preserves and extends the narrative of the Southeast Asians' subject salvation through U.S. intervention. Second, by insisting that refugees be saved from the grips of the underclass, it reinforces the terms that produce African Americans, and again, to varying degrees, <coughs> Latinos, as the undeserved, undeserving poor, domestic minorities for whom the underclass concept was originally formulated. In other words, refugee exceptionalism preserves and extends the justification for punishment of certain populations in the hyper ghetto. We might say then that taken together, the Cambodian refugee presence in the hyper ghetto, mediated through refugee exceptionalism, represents the convergence of two distinct yet relational genealogies of white supremacist governance, colonialism and slavery. Ra's presence here elucidates the hyper ghetto as or the Cambodian presence here elucidates the hyperghetto as slavery's afterlife. In turn, the hyperghetto as anti-blackness reveals the contours of an unfinished colonialism. So how does this all play out on the ground, as it were? How does refugee exceptions play out on the ground? And in the book, I speak of the multiple housing displacements experienced by uh, the book's protagonist and her family, Ra Pran. Um, before I move on to Ra, uh, just to give you a sense of how obscure this community is, or even though you know, 10,000, 4,000, 10,000 is a small number, but no one really knew about this community, including um, Mel Rosenthal, who is like the consummate Bronx hometown chronicler. He's like the guy who, when you look at South Bronx photos from like the 70s and 80s, like half of them are his. And one day he's just knocking on doors looking for like, you know, to give people information about lead paint poisoning, and he stumbles upon these Cambodian refugees, and he's blown away. And he starts shooting photographs, and this is one of them. Um, so, so to give you a sense, not even like the people who are Bronx historians really were paying attention to, to this community. And here's Ra Pran. This is an image from her, um, from her first days in a refugee camp in Thailand. She makes it to the United States in, in, uh, in 80, uh, 85, 86, in fact. And, um, and she undergoes a series of housing displacements, which I would talk about in the book. And with each housing displacement, the resettlement agency failed to move Ra and her family to another neighborhood with better housing and less violence. It merely relocated them to the next vacant apartment in the same troubled area. Each placement seemed only to renew her captivity in the liberal warfare that was the hyper ghetto. However, those handling Ra engaged in refugee exceptionalism telling her that her situation was only temporary, that the hardships of the Northwest Bronx was only a stop along the way to something better. To be sure, many Cambodians left the Bronx, but most did not find improved situations. They only moved laterally to other hyper ghettos throughout the Northeast, Philadelphia, Providence, Lowell, Massachusetts, and Camden, New Jersey. And if you know anything about Camden, New Jersey, 
there's just no good reason on earth that anyone would actually move to Canyon, New Jersey. <laughs> and then this, this was the site that the state and the private sector wanted to just go away. And yet you have Cambodians who somehow make it there. And that is the question. How do we explain the presence of these refugees in, into sites where new immigration is not supposed to take shape at all? Don't get me wrong. New immigrants post-1965, we settled to all parts of the city, many of them impoverished. But my argument is that very few, if any, save for Southeast Asian refugees, we settled to these hyper-ghetto spaces, right? Those, and other people, <coughs> sacrifice zones, right? Places that were meant to just go away. How do we explain that, right? And maybe I'll leave some time during the Q&A and we can explore that together. But that is really the, the question that drives this research. Many of those who stayed in the Bronx continued to live in the derelict apartments in which they were originally resettled. Others, like Ross, simply moved from one substandard apartment to the next within the same square two miles. All told, the Cambodians of the Northwest Bronx experienced no economic mobility, even as resettlement agencies, landlords, and other keepers of the hyper-ghetto over three decades consistently hailed them as perpetual newcomers on the verge of something else, as those only passing through. During the late 1990s, when I began working as a community organizer in the Northwest Bronx, I advocated for Cambodian refugees in the very same buildings that Ramirez had attempted to organize a decade earlier. I helped Cambodian tenants file complaints against building owners who were guilty of numerous habitability violations. The landlords accused me of being an interloper, an agitator, echoing the <laughs> social workers that stymied Ramirez's organizing efforts, they referred to Cambodian refugees as their, quote, new tenants, who, unlike the longer established black and Latino tenants, had never given them any trouble until now. It was completely not true, but that was their argument. They seemed unable to fathom that the Cambodian tenants had been living in their buildings for over 15 years. But they did not cast these refugees as model minority strivers. The landlords knew full well that the Cambodians were not economically mobile. If they preferred Cambodians over African American and Puerto Ricans, it was because the newcomers were impoverished or third world subjects who made slum buildings solvent again. They paid their rent and rarely complained about the poor housing conditions they endured. This made them valuable not as model minorities, but as continuous captives who did not transgress into hyper ghetto status. In keeping with the terms of refugee exceptionalism, the Cambodian refugees constantly renewed their status as those who were only in but never of the hyper-ghetto. Now, the consistency with which numerous agents practiced it over several decades, it being refugee exceptionalism, points to refugee exceptionalism's vast discursive power. And it wasn't limited to these conscious actions of um, you know, ruthless landlords or uh, unscrupulous social workers, right? um, or unscrupulous social scientists, for that matter. But I won't get into that, because <laughs> we, we won't have time for that. <laughs> um, as a community organizer, I noticed how refugee exceptionalism as subject-producing discourse was also carried out in philanthropy. Foundations that supported our work insisted that the poverty, joblessness, and poor health of Southeast Asian refugees was a matter of immigrant, quote, adaptation. In this way, they decoupled these violences from the broader war being waged against all inhabitants of the hyper-ghetto. Refugee exceptionalism came across similarly in my conversations with neighborhood school teachers who um, attributed their struggles of their Cambodian students to their newcomer status, even though many of these students had been born in the Bronx. The suggestion here was that the Cambodian students' poor grades and high dropout rates had little to do with the general assault on inner-city public education. The discourse of refugee exceptionalism was particularly pronounced in the mainstream media's coverage of the Bronx-Cambodian community. Since the mid-80s, the New York Times had been one of the few major newspapers to periodically cover the borough's Cambodian enclave. A cursory review of some of these articles from 94 to 2012 reveals, that, reveals the consistent representation of Cambodian re residents as perpetual newcomers to the Bronx hyper-ghetto. In 94, the Times ran a profile in which Sister Jean Marshall, one of the directors of the local assistance group, uh, gave her assessment of how long it takes a refugee to feel settled. Between 10 and 15 years for a Southeast Asian refugee to become a non-refugee, Sister Jean says. And she attributes this to all these various economic, cultural, and social obstacles. 
Okay, so according to Sister Jean's timeline, by 94, the earliest refugee arrivals had either already transitioned into non-refugee status or they were on the cusp of doing so. But then in 2000, the Times publishes another profile of the community, um, suggesting that the refugee community is nowhere near shedding their, their past, their refugee past. Entitled Children of the Killing Fields, the article notes that these young people, quote, face a host of distinctive problems. Few community groups exist to help out these new arrivals. And yet it had been 18 years since the first wave of Cambodian had resettled to the Bronx, and most of the teenagers interviewed for this article have, were actually born in either the Bronx or in, in, in refugee camps. And I know this because I, I sourced the article. I gave the reporter these young people, and yet he still wrote about them as if they had just arrived. Um, they knew nothing, these teenagers that is, of life in Cambodia or the Thai refugee camps, um, and yet their problems were framed as those of newcomers distinct from established residents, right? In these and other similar Times articles, um, the refugees are frozen in time. Oh yeah, and then in 2012, there's another article, as late as 2012, that says, quote, these refugees are trying to strike a balance between adopting American customs and holding fast to values from home. And meanwhile, by 2012, the Cambodians are like the longest standing residents in this neighborhood. I mean, if in these buildings, they've been there for the longest. They hold the longest leases. So in these and similar articles, the refugees are frozen in time. Indeed, over three decades, they're continuing in a state of arrival. They are not allowed to be anything other than the hyper ghettos recurring newcomers. And yet these articles refrain from casting refugees as model minority paragons of liberalism. Instead, they appear as captives who must be repeatedly saved from the named enemies of liberalism, namely the post-insurrectionary underclass. And here, once again, the Cambodian refugees are enlisted as the collateral damage of liberal warfare. So the challenge moving forward for both relational racial studies and critical refugee studies is to understand how these rescues and removals, this refusal to recognize the refugees, refugee settledness in the hyper ghetto stages different forms of anti-blackness. Um, indeed, to figure Cambodian refugees as suspended in this perpetual state of arrival is to disassociate refugee poverty from that of the true inhabitants of the hyper-ghetto, the enemies of liberalism. Casting this dynamic in terms of liberal warfare, we might say that, the ref that refugee exceptionalism insists on the unending rescue of the Cambodian refugee from urban abjection as a way to justify unending warfare against an undeserving and definitively black urban population. Now, by way of conclusion, the obligatory question posed by the scholar activists. What is to be done? What political opportunities exist to challenge the damaging and divisive effects of refugee exceptionalism? What alternative futures might be imagined and enact? And to this, the obligatory scholarly activist response to his own question, activism. Um, so here's an image from 1997, wow, almost 20 years, maybe early 98, and this is an image from our organizing days where um, Cambodian residents, as you can see, mostly women, mostly mothers and grandmothers, took over a health clinic that was threatening to cut um, the Southeast Asian mental health program, which many of them relied on, not just for, you know, um, counseling, but also as a site for, for networking, for bartering, for, um, you know, uh, it, was, it was a site that gave them identity, um, helped them forge uh, community and, and political action. And we were just going to do this protest right outside, like, you know, just standard, you know, placards. But they were like, let's just take over the waiting room and see what happens until we can get a meeting. So they staged this impromptu city. And I want you to focus on the woman in the middle, grandma, which is called the grandma, with the stop discrimination placard. This is 97, 98. Okay, so like, I've been in Austin for six and a half years, I go back every summer, and lo and behold, there's another protest happening around the same issue because, you know, 18 years later, the, um, health, the, the, the hospital corporation decides it wants to threaten this, this program with cuts again. And I shoot a photo of, of, of the protest from the summer of 2015. And lo and behold, who's right there? And I didn't even stay, I didn't stay, you're gonna think I stayed this. I didn't stay here. I was just putting the slides together. And then I, when I was going through, I'm like, wow, there she is. 
along with some of her, her crew. She's sitting there. I mean, I think she's guarding it, right? <laughs> but it speaks to this, this continuity, right, of, of struggle, this dignified struggle that this community engages in despite being invisibilized, despite living in obscurity, right? When, um, when it's time to act, they do act, right? And so, um, what I talk about in the book is the way in which their activism is driven by this notion of refugee temporality. The notion that their past captivities, their past sense of um, being subjected to arbitrary power, are reinscribed in their present condition. They are not under any illusion that they have achieved liberation, freedom, this transfigurative moment where they become non-refugees. There's, there's, this, there's this continuity. And, um, and moving forward, the ch what, I, what I'm concerned about is what's going to happen with that second and third generation, their children and grandchildren, who don't have access to that past, right? Because one of the things that um, I had to conclude in the end of the book is that it's actually worse for the second and third generation. Because all they know is life in the hyper ghetto. They don't have their skill sets honed from a previous moment. Right? And so here's where the activism and the organizing are as critical as ever. And um, what I'm going to argue is that if there is cause to be optimistic, it's because there are indeed younger activists and organizers on the ground engaged in building a political alternative, a new kind of refugee temporality that um, is, um, is connected, is, is taking shape among the second and third generation, but connected to that first generation. And there are a couple of qualities or characteristics of this, of this new politics, this new refugee temporality. It's a politics which begins by demonstrating through grassroots-led research, advocacy, and direct action that Cambodians have never been, as refugee exceptionalism proclaims, merely visitors to the hyper ghetto. That their entrenched poverty over three decades is um, firm evidence of a continued captivity. Second, it's a politics that links past and present, recognizing that the forces of liberal empire and war that drove their families out of Cambodia are inscribed in the liberal warfare carried out in the Bronx and in other hyper ghettos. To illustrate this point, allow me to invoke Chaya Chow, who is a young community organizer I feature in the book. In explaining the Cambodian presence in the hyper ghetto, Chaya asserts that the Bronx Cambodians have, quote, never left the camps. She's trying to, if you want to understand how they understand their situation, she says they've never really left the camps. In other words, their resettlement to the hyper-ghetto was neither historically incidental nor sociologically temporary. Right? They didn't just land here and, oh, wow, look, the Elmish Resettlement Program. There is a logic that attends to their arrival to these spaces. It's a logic. It's a continuation of their past conditions of captivity. And it's with this knowledge that I think we have some conditions of possibility for lasting alliances among Cambodians, African Americans, Puerto Ricans, and other held captive in the hyper ghetto. How might they use this knowledge to inform collective resistance? Organizations like Mekong NYC, which Chaya directs, co-founded, are building such alliances. Mekong is rooted in the Cambodian refugee community of the Bronx, yet it is also the nucleus of a multiracial coalition of Northwest Bronx groups working to address issues such as skyrocketing rents, cuts to community health clinics, and the privatization of public space. According to Chaya, it represents um, the mil a new milieu. Her organization is, is representative of a new milieu of Southeast Asian groups throughout the country that have made multiracial organizing a strategic priority. Similarly, for example, in Rhode Island, the Providence Youth and Student Movement, or PRISM, which is rooted in the Cambodian refugee community, is also the linchpin of the city's multiracial youth organizing. One of its core values is, quote, ghetto roots, which according to PRISM's mission statement means, quote, organizing on the streets, in homes, and in, and in the heart of communities, affirming solidarity with the most oppressed and most in need, end quote. PRISM was active in a recent campaign to pass municipal legislation to stop racial profiling 
in Providence, Rhode Island, which, and this serves the interest of all youth, in, of youth of color in the state. Another youth group, Freedom Inc., in Madison, Wisconsin, worked with both Hmong and African American youth to address a range of economic health and educational inequalities afflicting both communities. Moreover, it emphasizes the need to challenge patriarchy and heteronormativity through projects that support queer and gender non-conforming Hmong and African American high school students. Freedom Inc.'s slogan is, Our Community Is Our Campaign, which underscores the organization's belief that winning specific political or policy battles must go hand in hand with addressing the community's need to heal from traumas past and present. These groups represent the next phase of refugee movement in the hyper -ghetto. They prove that resistance is indeed taking shape among the children of refugees, articulated by and through members of other oppressed groups. At the same time, these forms of activism are rooted in the particular histories and conditions of Southeast Asian refugees as they draw on and extend the resiliency of the first generation that was resettled to the hyper -ghetto. The younger generation keeps this first generation close at hand to remind them that matters of justice remain unsettled, that redemption is elusive. Thank you. Um, thank you so much for the really insightful talk. I was wondering more about the refugee temporality yeah. um, idea that you talked about and your thoughts on if it's like a class and place specific issue because I think with I was thinking of for Vietnamese in Orange County who are framed a lot as successfully assimilated because of socioeconomic status and their political involvement but then <clears throat> or does this temporality also extend to these even more quote unquote successful groups? It's a great question. You know I think um, my work tends to draw a sharp distinction between the immigrant who resettles within the ethnic economy, right, structured by ethnic capital, co-ethnic employment, right, and then the refugees who are settled into spaces where there is no ethnic capital, right. Um, and so my argument, just so I can be clear about what I'm saying in the book, is really about a refugee temporality that takes shape in the latter because of the conditions of the latter. But at the same time, I think we would be um, misinformed for me to say that within the ethnic economies there aren't there isn't also some class variation right like there's so, there's some <coughs> Vietnamese who are living in Orange County and who are who are on welfare right who are not plugged into um, you know the Orange County ethnic economy the little Saigons right so um, I guess that's a dissatisfying answer because I'm saying <coughs> both and but what I would say is that refugee temporality has to do with the way in which certain forms of state-mediated punishment and captivity are reinscribed in certain urban spaces. And that is most pronounced in the hyper -ghetto, although not completely impossible in the ethnic economy. Yeah, um, so near the beginning of the talk, oh, I'm sorry. No, go ahead. No, thank you. So near the beginning, you spoke about the uh, blackening of Southeastern, uh, I'm sorry, um, yeah, Southeast Asian um, refugees. So, how does that blackening come about? Is it juridical? Is it social? So, so to be clear, blackening is Iwa Ong's term. Right. Yeah, so, right. and she wrote this brilliant ethnography called Buddha is Hiding. It's like the seminal text in, um, you know, Southeast Asian urban studies. And she's she makes this argument that it's, um, it's ideological and discursive, like when you look at like reports, policy reports, of journalism about Southeast Asian refugees, journalists start to write about them in ways that associate them more with African Americans as opposed to whites. And and if you think about it, how I understand it, she places Southeast Asians on a spectrum between black and white, right? Mm -hmm. And depending on how people are writing about them, they slide one way or the next. I actually disagree with that analysis in, in my book because I, I don't think that spectral schemas work. I, I, was, I think it's more triangular in the sense that um, white supremacy positions refugees and Asian Americans in general at a certain coordinate um, that valorizes them on the one hand, diminishes them on the other, but in, in positioning them 
also stages anti-black, sets up the coordinate for anti-black, right? And so you can't really think of refugees as sliding to whiteness or blackness. It's really a position, not a, a spectrum. Does that make sense? Yeah. Thank you. Um, again, thank you for your research. I'm a doctoral candidate, so you're helping um, me clarify my thought processes. Um, I have a question, or I just want some clarification, that your study focuses on the Bronx and the East Coast. Mm -hmm. uh, have you made any connections with the Southern California com Cambodian community situations and challenges? That's question number yeah. one. And um, you mentioned, the, I guess, the continuing situation of being a migrant, right. um, the feeling of not really having a home or a place. Mm -hmm. Um, can you comment on that? I see similarities yeah. with, in many cases, my family immigrated from Mississippi mm -hmm. during what I call the apartheid era mm -hmm. to California, yeah. and my mother never really felt at home here. Mm -hmm. So I see a lot of similarities. So, um, Thank you two for questions. Question. Mm -hmm. So far be it from me to um, exacerbate West Coast and East Coast. <laughs> but, you know, I have to say that this book, and I'll probably back off of this with more books about Southeast Asian refugees on the East Coast are written, but this book is, is really about an East Coast experience that is distinct from um, really the Long Beach experience. Again, not to say that there aren't elements and very profound elements that the Long Beach community shares with hyper-ghettos, not just in the Bronx, but like Philly, right, Camden, right? Um, places that you wouldn't even know they were Cambodian. Danbury, Connecticut, well, I mean, how, how, do we, how do we figure, right? And so what, I, what I'm doing with the Bronx study is saying this is representative of these like Cambodian ethnic enclaves that sometimes number in the ones of thousands, um, where again, ethnic capital is irrelevant. <laughs> and quite honestly, the class situation is relatively homogeneous. And, and the proof I have of it now is that, you know, you would expect, given my analysis, that I would get some pushback from the Cambodian professional class and the business class and say, hey, we don't really think this is the right way to represent. But there are none. Right. I mean, which is remarkable. Watch when I get home, if I get an email. <laughs> but, and even like in, in Austin, I'm friends with this Cambodian guy who's like a business leader, you know, and I thought he's going to hate this book. Man. He's just going to like rip, rip it. But he's like, I'm just glad someone is writing about Cambodians. And so the class situation is really distinct, and I think, I digress from your question, but what I'm saying is that there is a class differentiation within um, the Long Beach community in Southern California that you don't see on the East Coast, and that's what I'm trying to represent here. And by way of, you know, your last question, yeah, you know, this, this notion of home is, is mythological, it's fictive. Um, and, and there's a certain kind of poetics that people are finding in their displacement, right? Um, in the fact that there is no home, and once they left, they can never go back. Mm -hmm. And the protagonist in the book, Ra, she talks about that. She talks about, like, you know, she'd go back to visit family, but home is gone, um, and it'll never come back. And her children also kind of adopt that, and that's part of this concept of refugee temporality that I'm trying to um, expound on in the book. First of all, thank you so much. Wonderful presentation. By the way, you can get the book Temple University Press. You could get it through Amazon. You could download it. It's in the Kindle version, you know, which is the version I have, so you can't sign it. For it. Um, so let me let me just ask a question. I, I really love the ending and the potential uh, always in multiracial yeah. organizing. Um, but I want to ask about CAB. Yeah. Because my understanding back in those days in the 90s was that CAB was really ahead of its time and that it was already doing multiracial right now. Yeah. So I'm wondering, given your experience with, with CAB and their particular position on this, do you see uh, an adoption of, of a framework that they established, or is this a new framework? What's the relationship? It's, it's um, the extension of the framework, and I think it's also realizing that whereas the multiracial work that we did at CAB, which I agree was um, a bit ahead of its time, is no longer um, supplemental to the organizing work of groups like MECOM, PRISM, Freedom Make. It's moved from being something that you know, we do in addition to our core work to being the core work. And here's where um, 
you know, I'm still struggling with this question I often get asked, which is what is the correct paradigm in which to understand Southeast Asian refugee organizing and activism? And I have to say at this point that it's not an Asian American activist paradigm. That, it's, that, that paradigm is inadequate. That um, when we think about what's going on in these neighborhoods, these Cambodian and Laotian youth really have to develop strategies, discourses, rhetorical strategies that center their identities as those who are living in, in these hyper ghetto spaces. Um, not that they can't in some ways kind of talk about what it's, you know, what it's like to be Asian American, and Asian American racial formation, and, and those matters. But I, I just don't think anymore that um, that the multiracial stuff is is in addition to. I think it's it's more it's more centered now, and that's the feeling I'm getting from from these young people when I talk to them, and, and, and I, I think of the difference between my work with them, you know, 15, 20 years ago, and the work they're doing now. And that the Asian American piece is really kind of in drop, and it's more like this multiracial, urban kind of identity. Um, and, and you know, not to kind of air organizational dirty laundry, we're not being videotaped, oh, we are. <laughs> but like, you know, this is probably why Mekong, as an organization, broke off from, from CAD, because it realized that it outgrows certain situations. And I think that's, that's appropriate, you know? I think right. it's, it's, a, it's an appropriate move that it outlived that framework. Right. Just, just follow up. Yeah. And that's different from what you see in the academy. <laughs> <laughs> I'll say this. I'll say that the um, and Gracie can back <laughs> that the Southeast Asian refugee studies people within Asian American studies are are represent an insurgent kind of quality, right? They have an insurgent. That, 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 that it's a critical quality. It's a critical, quality, critical refugee studies, and it, and I think it, it sits in this necessary kind of uncomfortable position within Asian American studies as a result. That was actually kind of one of the things I wanted to raise, though, um, which I completely agree, um, uh, which is that, you know, I, I can see how you're um, being really careful to sort of um, differentiate, um, you know, these Cambodians in the hyper-ghetto from, like, you know, other Southeast Asians who have access to sort of enclave economies, right? <coughs> But where I do kind of see um, a kind of um, connection to critical uh, refugee studies is exactly the ways in which the kind of structure of feeling of saving, you know, and um, and you know, uh, is completely the organ organizational kind of framework for refugees, right? So whether, like in Yen's work, yep. whether it's um, the model minority narrative, right? It's the model minority narrative through saving. Right. right, which is different from the model minority narrative for like East Asians, right? right. Um, and um, so I was thinking about that, you know, at, uh, uh, about that narrative of save, of like, you know, of you know, saving, rescue, <coughs> right? And um, um, and uh, the the ways in which that is a kind of um, like erasure of the past, right? Like, so in other words, it's like, oh, like things were terrible over there, right? But we've saved you and you're, you're, you're here now, yeah. right? Um, and, you know, even though that doesn't in any way mitigate the actual conditions, right. like deeply necro political conditions right. that Cambodians live in in the hyper ghetto, that narrative of saving is that kind of um, temporal break, yeah. right? Which is what that kind of, um, that um, sort of, refugee temporality that you're identifying is kind of trying to counter, right? right? So, and I can imagine, and, and from a lot of different scholarship in Southeast Asian studies, but also like in, um, like say, like more radical or um, Korean American studies, right? Or, you know, different kinds of engagements with um, like war trauma and things like yeah. that. Like, you know, that that seems to be that kind is, of a connection. Right, absolutely, yeah. I I'd have to agree. I'd have to agree. You know, um, where the, the kind of the critical projects within Asian American studies, there is this 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 link around saving. Um, so maybe what I'll do is I'll revise my comment and say that I think it's 
more pertinent on the ground with the organizing strategy and with, within, within scholarship um, is yet to be seen. Thank you so much for your talk. Um, you made a quick comment about, uh, you were going through the statistics, mm -hmm. about how uh, these uh, Cambodian uh, refugees were, you know, had the, the lowest health care, the, the lowest uh, income rates of any group in the U.S. except for uh, Native Americans, right, and reservations. And it occurred to me that there seems to be some sort of connection in the kind of um, yes. like forced domestic dependency, yeah. right, mm -hmm. uh, between both groups. Yes. Um, and I was wondering if you could maybe just say a couple words on that. Absolutely. Do we have another half hour? Because <laughs> <laughs> <Sorry. laughs> this is the part where, like, you know, I was, I know, I was like, we got an hour. Um, you're absolutely right. And this is like the part of the book that I just had to leave on the cutting room floor <laughs> because it just was, I just couldn't do it. But, okay, so let's just cut to the chase. There's a reason why, right, state-mediated migrants, refugees, are directed where? To sites of state-mediated warfare, right? right? Um, where, um, you know, African Americans are uh, confined by the state post-1967, and then those who have ostensibly internal colonial status, yeah. Mexican American and Puerto Ricans are also, right? I mean, these are folks who um, don't necessarily tra travel the circuit of capital alone, but also always a state-mediated circuit, right? Um, and at the same time, when you look at um, the situation with the Native Americans, you, you're seeing, you know, there's state mediation there as well. There's an internal domestic kind of condition. So, um, so I left all this stuff on the cutting room floor because it just, um, in the end, it didn't have as much teeth as, as I wanted to have. But I think you're you're absolutely right that there is the reason why the Cambodian there's a Cambodian presence in the hyper ghetto has everything to do with um, with state mediation with with certain with state design statecraft. And, um, and then when you look at these statistics, right, these double-digit figures, right, who do they apply to? They apply to those with internal colonial status, African Americans and Native Americans. This isn't to say that, you know, Dominicans aren't also really poor, right? And this isn't to say that, you know, all the other ethnic groups aren't also dealing with working poverty, but it's distinct, and that is, um, that, that's, the, that's the distillation that I hope this work does, and I'm glad you picked up. Thank you. Oh, that was really my question almost exactly, but I'm just to follow up on that. Um, so I wonder, I mean, the, the thing is that Native Americans are in some ways um, the, the polar opposite. I mean, they're not just another state media minority population. They're the polar opposite in the sense that they were here if they could see the debate. Um, and so they're the kind of polar opposite of the refugee. That's the recent, the eternally recent arrival, right? I wonder if you thought about that, and also in terms of your kind of um, racial triangle where Asian Americans are being set up in a particular way in relation to anti-blackness, where you see Native Americans. Yeah. And where are they in the triangle? Like point four in the. <laughs> yeah. Well, well, how? And this is a great question that always comes up, especially in the classroom. You know, it's it's it's. Um, it's triangular by way of schema, right? But it doesn't mean that um, that every group sits at the same coordinate, right? And so, um, so, and the reason I say that is because the Asian American, like who lives in the ethnic economy, sits at a specific coordinate with relation to African Americans or blackness and, and, and whiteness. Mm -hmm. um, and the refugees sits at a different coordinate. And I wanted to make this case that they weren't the same, right? And I would say the same is true for, for Puerto Ricans, um, Mexican Americans, Native Americans. So we would have to map it based on the different um, particularities. We'd have, we, should, we should map it based on the different particularities. Um, but in, in making this case around triangulation, it wasn't to say that there's only one triangle. Mm -hmm. what, it, what it was to say is that 
the coordinate that the refugee sits at is not a model minority coordinate, even as triangulation is the effective framework. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, I think that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. 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 Yeah.